Advent is time of preparation and already well underway. In the business, it is for us to forget to prepare for Christ's arrival. The impact of his coming on our lives can only be as much as we have prepared. Good morning to you all. As we are gathered to hear the word of God, as we are listening from our different places, let us call our thoughts together and remember that it is only God who can help us in our situation as we prepare for Christmas. We know that this year is a different year. People will not be gathered sometimes with their families because of traveling restrictions. But we want to thank God that God is always there wherever we are. God is with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We want to thank you for the love you have shown to us. We want to thank you that we are gathered here. Gracious God, who comes to us that we might come to you. We proclaim with the prophets before us. We let go of that which would hold us back. We straighten our paths and clear the way. So that for a moment, at this time, in this place, for just a while, we might meet you, glimpse something of your glory, and encounter the one who came, so that eternity might be changed. Bless us this morning, Father, as we hear your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to call Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and uh, what a wonderful day to be reading the Word of God to you. Uh, today we'll be reading from Mark 1, 1 to 8, for starters. Uh, it says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare you your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I'll baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. And the next scripture I'll be reading is from Isaiah 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your, your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sins have been paid for. Then she has received from the Lord's hands double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. A voice says, Cry out! And I, and I said, What shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who brings good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who brings good news to Jerusalem, 
Lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judea, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense, recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock, flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. And this is the amazing word of the Lord. Um, can't wait to hear what Johnson's going to share with us today. So we'll get him back and hear, hear what he's got to say. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you so much, Brother Ben, for the reading of the word of God. Uh, from Mark chapter 1, verse 1 to 8, and to Isaiah 40, verse 1 to 11, I've come up with a theme, cultural revolution or a spiritual problem. Cultural revolution or a spiritual problem. Can you imagine what it would be like if John the Baptizer were the pastor of this congregation today? I wonder who would run away first, John or the rest of us. The way the scriptures describe him, it sounds as if he would have been very hard to get along with. The man would never have come to your home for dinner. For instance, because he ate only locust and wild honey. Most of you ladies don't know how to fix locust. I don't think so. He never drank any alcohol, so he would have been no good at cocktail party. He was loud and probably obnoxious. He looked like a widow, going around in a coat of camel's fair. If he were our pastor, he would probably be embarrassed to death if we had ever to introduce him to any of our friends. Worst of all, he was always talking about sin, helping at people, preaching repentance over and over again. He even did that to the king, King Herod. John does not sound very attractive, and yet the scriptures say about him, there was a man sent from God and his name was John. In John 1 verse 6. While John may not sound very attractive by the description, Nevertheless, there was something about him that attracted people to him. Mark tells us that all of Judea and all the people in Jerusalem came to see him, which means people were attracted by something. Multitudes of people were attracted to him and believed that he had to say because they were baptized by him. All kinds of people came, tax collectors, soldiers, Pharisees, Sadducees, temple priests, they all came asking John what to do and they listened to what he was telling them. One could attribute John's popularity to a charismatic personality, perhaps. Everyone, in a while a person comes along with such a magnetic personality that everyone automatically looks up to him. Bob Hawke of Australia, John Kennett of, of United States of America, were like that. Whether they did good or bad didn't matter or all that much people, most people want. People just plain liked them. And one could say that John the Baptist was of that charismatic type also. But there was a great deal more to it than that. There is something more to it than that. John was a man sent from God with a specific job to do. Writing for God, Isaiah prophesied that John would come and explain what he would be. Behold, I send a messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Those are the words from Isaiah. John was sent from God to get people ready for the arrival of God's son, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ. God prompted people to flock to John so that he could prepare them for the good news of salvation. So in the, in the play God's Spell, a modern retelling of the good news of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist is the first character on the stage. The play begins with him. Much as God's plan of salvation began to be unfolded through him, so in the play John appears on stage dressed like a circus ringmaster. 
One gets the message that this job was to get the show going. As God's spell begins, there is a beautiful song which John sings. The melody is haunting and the words repeat over and over. Prepare you the way of the Lord. So John was special from the very beginning. St. Luke, whom tradition tells was a doctor, relates an incident in the early life of John that shows how powerful God's influence on him was from the start. When John was still in the womb of mother Elizabeth, in about the sixth month of his pregnancy, Mary, pregnant with Jesus, came to visit Elizabeth. The two women were relatives. When Mary came closer to John's mother, John lived within his mother's womb. Those of you who have been pregnant can appreciate the wonder of such acrobatic activity in the stomach. He jumped inside the womb. Dr. Luke explains because when he heard the voice of the Savior's mother, he recognized her to be the mother of the Lord. Luke knew about babies moving around in the womb. He also knew that John was chosen by God before time began to do a job for the Lord. So John's purpose in life was given to him by God. All that expected from John was that he do what God wanted him to do. God put him at the right time and at the right, right place to carry out his mission. Our purpose in life is given to us by God as well. He has put us in the right place at the right time for us. So wherever you are, you are at the right place at the right time. All he expects of us is that we obey him. When we do, he promised to fulfill his purposes for us in Psalm 56 verse 2. So John's God-given purpose in life was to prepare the way of the Lord. He did that by preaching the, the word of sin. John preached sin with enthusiastic abandon. He called the people who came to him, you brood of vipers, and condemned their incense, insincere reading. Be a fruit that befit repentance. He shouted. Don't just say you are sorry for your sin. Show it. That is what John is saying. So John's going preaching sin so harshly was not to humiliate people, but rather to shake them out of their idolatry of believing in themselves and their good works. So he wanted to show them how desperately they need a savior. They really needed a savior. And that's why he was telling them. Having convinced them of their sin, he pointed out to them the solution to their problem by pointing to Jesus announcing, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So he's pointing to Jesus, not to himself. From John, the people not only heard about their damning iniquity, but also about God's redeeming love, his deliverance in Jesus Christ, the Savior. So the proclamation of sin is as valid today as it was in John's time. Sin has not stopped being a problem. It is still an inherent part of every human life. The good news of salvation in Jesus Christ too begins with the bad news of sin. There are some who would preach sin less and God's love more. We need to preach God's love as much as possible. But it will have no meaning at all if we do not preach sin. So to fail to preach sin is to place an obstacle in the way of the gospel. It's a mistake to make light of sin. Our Lord Jesus thought it was pretty serious stuff. In fact, some of his miracles one gets the distinct impression that he thought it was our greatest problem. Jesus always forgives sin first and then heals sick. Your sins are forgiven. That was his first message. And then you are healed. Which means he took sin seriously. As bad as infirmity is, sin is far worse because sin kills. Instead of addressing the real problem of sin, we have developed a tendency in these later days to sugarcoat the problem with our language. We speak instead of cultural revolutions. It's a revolution. It's our era. It's 21st century. Things have changed. It's not like back then. 
People living together before marriage is not a sin problem. They argue. But the result of our cultural revolution, it's a cultural revolution. Things have changed. As part of our cultural revolution that we are experiencing right now, we are suffering from an erosion of respect for authority. Nobody wants to respect authority anymore because of this cultural revolution. Children do not respect their parents anymore. They do not respect their teachers. Even if they do not respect anybody. Adults do not respect the boss, the spouse, or the government officials. This is not a cultural problem, but a spiritual one. And it is sin. It is sin. Perhaps one of the worst indicators of sin in our lives is the fact that we are almost never stop asking if something is right or wrong anymore. We don't do that. We only ask if it feels good. Is it convenient, expedient, or easy? Especially in our use of technology, we do this. Our technology has expanded so wonderfully that we can do all kinds of near miracles now. Babies are conceived in test tubes now. It's so easy. We can do these things. We, we often not even stop the first to ask whether it is good or bad. We are just doing it. And we think everything is okay. Paul wrote a catalog of sin to describe Roman society nearly 2,000 years ago. What happens back then is not exchanged. Listen to what Paul says. Homosexuality. Wickedness. Evil. Covetousness. Malice. Envy. Murder. Strife. Deceit. Gossip. Slander. Hatred of God. Insolence. Haughtiness. Boastfulness, invention of evil, disobedience to parents, foolishness, faithfulness, heartlessness, ruthlessness. If you read Romans 1, verse 26 to 31, you find all this. These are not cultural dilemmas. It's not a cultural revolution. They are sin. John preached repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is nothing less than owning up to the reality of our sinfulness. Some people define repentance as turning away from sin, not sinning anymore. If that's the case, they, then no one has ever truly repented. For we sin over and over again until we die. So true repentance is turning away from carelessness attitude about sin. Repentance means turning away from believing that sin is not a problem and confessing that it is indeed my problem. So the unrepentant in John's day were the Pharisees who said they had no sin. Anyone who thinks it is not a sinner, that person is not repentant. So the repentant were all those who confessed their sin. So many people came to John confessing their sin. That's why they had a way to handle the problem. It does not Good to pretend sin isn't real. To try to cover it up. There are certain people who try to do it. Adam and Eve. When they sin, they try to cover up. They try to hide from God. Adam, Adam, where are you? Hiding from, you can't hide from God. God will always see you. They try to cover their nakedness, their sin, with fig leaves. But the fig leaves do, do didn't do their job. They didn't work. There's no way to deny the reality of sin. But when we confess it, God is faithful and just and forgive us. So he covers our nakedness, our sin with the sparkling robe of Christ's righteousness. Because God lives in us who believe in his son Jesus as our savior, we know there's no way to hide from him. We don't even try. We confess Oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When you confess before God, then God is there to help you. Then God is there to guide us. Mercy is precisely what God gives us for the sake of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In his precious name, we thank God that such mercy is so freely given. Amen to that. It's given freely. So what we need is just to confess that we are sinners. Every day of our life we sin. 
We sin by the way we talk, by the way we walk, by the way we dress up. But it's because we have told ourselves it's cultural revolution. It's not cultural revolution. It's a sin. It's a problem. It's a spiritual problem which needs to be addressed spiritually. And the only way is to come before the Lord and say, yes, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. So, I just want to urge you, brothers and sisters, to come right now before the throne of God and ask forgiveness. When you ask forgiveness, then you'll be set free. God bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we come before you. As we come before you, knowing that you are a forgiving Father. You are ascending, Father. You say, see, I'm sending a messenger, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Lord, we think about all the ways the word can be heard in the world. We sometimes take our ease access to the Bible or for granted. We pray that we would realize how privileged we are. We pray for all the people for whom a copy of the Bible is lodged for their treasure. For those who are so grateful to have their own. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the people who work so hard to translate the Bibles into other languages. For the organization they belong to who do so much to spread your message. We pray for all the gifted and created people who can share your wisdom with us in new ways. For songwriters, storytellers, for choirs and musicians who make your word speak to us in such wonderful ways. We pray for ourselves that we might be truly, we might be true to your way. Lord, graciously hear us as we cry out to you. Amen. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withers, the flowers face, but the word of God will stand forever. The grass withers, the flowers face, but the word of God will stand forever. This is the word of God. Same today, tomorrow, as it was yesterday. It never changes. It's the word of God. Let us pray for our offerings. I would urge you to bring your offering right now so that we can thank God. This is our second week in Advent. We are thanking. Who are we thanking? We are thanking and celebrating hope, with hope, joy, love, and peace for the coming of our Savior. Hold your offering. Let us pray together. Father, I pr pray right now as I bring every offering those who have heard the word of God those who want to thank God for what God has done to their lives I pray for this offering Lord, that you can multiply it You can multiply this special gift so that it can be used for your kingdom. Bless this offering, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for this wonderful thing you have shown. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.